So for the second Syntho podcast, I sat down with good friend Ivan Cutts. He runs Platform 18 in Glasgow. Uh, it's a really interesting chat. Just literally finished then. So I hope you enjoy it. I've been doing a lot of kind of... Is this recording now? Yeah, uh, yeah, we'll record the whole thing. I'll just start at a convenient point. Yeah, okay, no worries. Uh, yeah, like, so I've basically just... I've been doing a lot of fitness, but it's been quite a nice balance. I've enjoyed it. I've still been doing a wee bit of partying and I've had a few friends round and stuff. And But uh, pretty much a lot of running, to be honest. Yeah. I've done, I've done, I've done, I've done similar, like more exercise, and I feel well, well less guilty than enjoying the weekend. Mm. And my uh, things, my thing's just been as long as I don't let Monday win, then I'll do whatever yeah. I want on the weekend. <laughs> yeah, no, that's true. Actually, yeah, man. Like as I say, I think it's be balanced. I take the dog out in the morning, trying to put a ten k in, and then come up and do a bit of work and like in here. So it's yeah. uh, I've since we were last up, I've actually sold the sold the studio. So. Everything's kind of moved into this my house now because we moved into our house recently and uh, yeah, I've just kind of just uh, still kind of getting refurbed and stuff. Yeah. Like that. Is it you in your studio at the moment? Yeah, in my studio. Yeah, it's actually myself getting a refurb and get some wooden floor. And at the moment, I'm facing like this way, but the window mm. is there, there, so it would actually right. sound better if it was all facing that way. But okay. uh, it's just a bit of a job in it when you move everything around, recable it, and all that shit. Yeah. And what's the uh, idea behind the wooden floor? Is that no? Uh, it more, no, no, aesthetics. It's because at the moment I've got black carpets. As you can actually see, it's pretty dark in here. Um, yeah. But when I put the actual lights on, it's a bit harsh. You know, you've got proper bright white mm. lights. And because I'm underground, there's not much daylight. So the wooden yeah. floor is just to brighten the room up. A post yeah. white carpet when you're partying and stuff isn't a good idea, is it? Yeah. So is this, <laughs> is that, is this in your house then? No? Yeah, yeah. I've lived basically... Um, I live with my parents, but I think I explained to you before, it's like a two-level yeah. apartment, but it's really mm. big. It's like a, probably the biggest apartment ever. But mm. me and my brother are on one floor, my parents are on another floor. We're getting a kitchen made downstairs at the moment. Oh, um, so I'm never going to move out, probably. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's been teeth, actually. Uh, so you, you've been doing a wee bit of partying yourself then? Just to... uh, well, I did about three months without partying and got right. an incredible amount of work done. Yeah. Um, I was, obviously wasn't out of choice, was it, to stop going to clubs and all that? Um, but it's been definitely a nice change, I think. I was yeah. having a chat to someone today. You know, when you, know, when you don't actually let the party win, there's never a Monday or a Tuesday or a Wednesday. Obviously, you've got to come turn up and do a bit of work on a Monday, but just yeah. wake up every day and just do life as it comes, I think, which has been mm. nice and refreshing, not living for the weekend, which I think yeah. you can get that hold on you, can't it? Yeah, no, totally. I'm, I'm at the age now, it's the, the recovery is much longer now. <laughs> it takes yeah. me takes me till Wednesday to get over it really. So I, I'm I'm really picking and choosing when I'm I'm doing it now. So yeah. Uh, but yeah. But is there anything been going on in Manchester? What's been Nothing. happening well, down your way? It was obviously that big illegal rave that was on the news. There was a few of them wanting that was um a few people got stabbed, I think, of and yeah. all sorts. But I think yeah, that, that, kinda put, annoyed me that that kinda annoyed me that that whole yeah, thing. Yeah, that put a big highlight on the fact mm. that's one thing me and you have got in common, we're both putting some big big parties over the years. Um, yeah. And then to see people put on things with no regulation, no security, and, the, yeah. and they're still cashing in, and then Cash people are also putting a lot of money into something, and we can't even do the parties. Mm -hmm. I think that was quite a big um, a low blow, wasn't it, for promoters like us? Yeah, that is like, yeah, especially the costs it involves when I do my street party and stuff like that. Like in even this year, well, the start of this year, the council try to put on like a, a levy tax, it's called environmental levy tax, which it, which is basically went from my road closure fee going up four hundred percent from the year before. Yeah. So when you when you've got stuff like that getting thrown into the mix and then you're you're battling against it and then you're seeing all these illegal waves and what is it, six thousand people at a tenner ahead or something, isn't it? Like something like that is crazy. But I, th I think I think that'd be a good point actually. Um uh, to ex Tell everyone about your party. Uh, mm. not a lot of people have seen it. Um, mm. Just so everyone gets a proper idea of mm. the, the level that your party's at. So when when you started it and then how you've gone from the beginnings to booking Richie Horton in a, on a street. Uh, yeah, well, it's kind of... I've done a season in 2012 and it'd be fun. To be honest, I went to Abifa because I'd be a bit kind of lost within my own city and... A bit, a bit bored maybe of what was happening, so I just went out to be to see if I could find 
some inspiration, whatever. So when I came back for Aviva, I, I had a kind of new wee while of the head, and I just kind of decided to go a walk in Glasgow, and yeah, just came across West Street. So platform eighteen is if you've not if you've not seen it or heard of it, is it's underneath two railway bridges in there. Uh, so I was just going to walk and it was actually with Roscoe one of the days because I had him booked to play at one of the club events I used to run and the two is just kind of caught eye with each other when we were down at this venue and just a little playing like this would be sick if you could do a rave here yeah. wouldn't it so it was actually a wee bit round the corner that I was more interested in but I looked into that and it was it was getting demolished and it couldn't happen so yeah I just had to go down the old avenues and kind of look into seeing who owned the street and it ended up as council, which made it a wee bit more awkward. Uh, but yeah, we just went down that road and kind of found out how to do everything correctly, really. All you have to do with the council is tick the boxes. If you don't tick the boxes, then they're obviously going to come down hard on you. But yeah, that's, that's kind of my motto, is just keep everything a good standard, do what they say. and. As as we, as we were just talking about the legal raves and then people getting stabbed and all that, and next thing is going to be a fire or one of them. It's like the council got these things in place for a reason. Do you yeah. know what I mean? It is it is a bit of a pain in the ass. Don't get me wrong, but I would rather that than somebody dying at my rave. <laughs> and how many how many years you've been doing it now then? So you started in twenty I be for twenty twelve, and then you got back from there and did the first platform <laughs> the following year. Was it? Uh, yeah, so 2012, then it was 2013 that I'd done uh, the first rave, and that was with Roscoe and Chris Moran for Fuse. And uh, yeah, it was just proper minimal setup, really. It wasn't, there was no production at all. We just get a set of decks, sound system, and just set up on the street. And it's kind of evolved each year. I did try and keep it as minimal as possible, but just to be young people are coming through that they like to see they like to have a bit more than just a set of decks and music these days so yeah. I've had to look into more production which is ultimately more costs which yeah is- i think um that was a big thing for us actually hide and seek mm-hmm. we underestimated the cost of production in the end and i think when you start getting into that side of things it's almost it's like mm-hmm. a, a never-ending pit isn't it because you think if i want to do it i might as well do it properly so you see one light rig for this cost, then you go to the next one, then it's like, oh, it's never yeah. ending, really, isn't it? Yeah, like, usually I get my kind of top budget for these things, but it depends on ticket sales. Like, yeah. the, if your ticket sales are a bit slow, you maybe need to strip back on production. But yeah. uh, I'm in a good position for, well, which was meant to be this year's party with Richie Houghton, but it's moved to next year. I'm in a good position now to proper put in a really good production yeah. underneath that bridge so yeah I'm working with a good team uh, to get that all sorted at the moment. So. Well it's funny because I remember we um, we obviously met a few years ago now but I remember we met up at ADA for a beer and you told me the next day you went out, I don't think we actually ended up meeting up, I can't remember and then you were telling me you actually met with Richie Orton's agent I'm pretty sure the next day for a chat and that must have been around the time you must have first, because I think we're still quite a way off and he told me you met at AD with because you were with one of your mates. And yeah, I was with Mark. Yeah, uh, I'm not, do you know I've actually never met Richie Horton's agent, uh, Brendan. Uh, but I've been emailing him for years, like absolute years, with with probably half of that being no response. But uh, as, the, as, as the parties grew, grew and the bookings have come in, uh, like Amelie Lenz and. Uh, Jeff Mills and, and stuff like that I've had them play and Matthew Johnson they kind of started to give me a wee bit of notice and uh, you you probably know yourself the politics in your city like uh, it's Manchester like we're uh, yeah I think Manchester like, swipe, swipe the floor I'm guessing you know I mean? yeah because there is big promoters in Manchester and then there's obviously a lot of things in place so mm. I'll work around it yeah so it's, it's pretty similar to Glasgow where it was uh, it was a couple of big dogs in Glasgow that were obviously stopping these bookings going in. So for me to, for Richie, who's never played for MDL's bar one promoter in Glasgow to accept my offer in the, in the end was, was pretty... That's insane. Pretty big, pretty big moment for me. And it's like, 
it's always been my hero, Richie Horton. Yeah, I remember you telling me, I can't remember why I think that, maybe it was like Ben Clock's agent or something you met up with. Or something. It was Ben Clock. Ah, okay, yeah. It was, uh, yeah. Well, yeah, because that really hit home with me. I was like, ah, maybe that's how, well, I guess it is. A lot of the making connections with the big dogs is going the extra mile and face-to-face. Because I think with anything, even with um, sending demos out and shit, meeting someone face-to-face, it always lasts, goes a bit further, doesn't it? And the relationship tends yeah. to uh, last a bit longer, I think. Yeah, like, I'm not one of these promoters that will ever, ever say, to you, like, another promoter, oh, that's my booking or my DJ yeah. or, like, like, and like that. That's always frustrated me growing, growing up in the scene, like, this, uh, like, this kind of stubbornness between promoters. But I can't really stress enough how much AD is, is important if you're wanting to promote events. Like, I wouldn't have got half the bookings that I, well, probably wouldn't get any of them really if, if it wasn't for ADE because you can explain the story, you can show them the party better, you, you know yourself with emails, it's kind of, you know. they, they probably get a million emails a week, do you know what I mean? So they maybe just scan by and don't really care. So the, like the the Jeff Mills one was a big, big one for me because that, that was the first major booking really that kind of, uh, showing the way to the other artistically for me. So yeah. Yeah, and that was quite intriguing. Like, <laughs> yeah, I think it was quite intriguing. Not like, the story time, not the Jeff Mills. It was in with the mixer. The what was it called again? The Vestax yeah. mixer or something. That's right here. Ah, uh, yeah. Yeah, that's it right there. It's got his when, signature on it at the top. Uh, what year was that from? Uh, Jeff. Well, Jeff Mills was my thirtieth birthday, so that was a few years ago. And what year was the mixer from? Sorry, was this, is it like the nat some from the nineties or something? Yeah, it's from the nineties, but this is brand new. Like, it was like ah. a, a mad story. Like just because it was my first major booking, Jeff Mills, like like huge. Uh, on his radar, it was it was a Vestax or it was a DGM one thousand. Like you could you it was either what either one, but that was the first choice. So I just went out all out to <laughs> go, and, go and get this. Do you know what yeah. I mean? So I managed to like I couldn't get it anywhere. Like nobody was really high on it because it's very rare and. I eventually found one. It was in a basement in Gre- Greenland. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, so I, it was just it was complicated to try and buy it. And then I realised they realised when I bought it, and they'd sent it out because I had to get it sent to Berlin. I, I can't remember who it was in Berlin. It was one of my friends accepted it in Berlin because it wouldn't go straight to the UK. But they emailed me when it was in Berlin saying that it was meant to be for another promoter in France. And it was they were hoping for it to get sent back, but I was like, no chance. <laughs> so I made sure that my pal sent it right straight to me in Berlin. So um, yeah, I was lucky to get it, and and that's why it's just sitting in my studio now, just as a as a as a wee, uh, souvenir, I suppose. <laughs> Did you do him in that car park, Jeff Mills, or was it under West Street? No, it was just around the corner in the warehouse. So yeah. when you came in my studio downstairs, it was a football park in the car park. Yeah. yeah. So I done that there, and I done that for my my thirtieth. I had Matthew Johnson and my friend Gary Beck. Yeah, yeah. so it's quite nice spec because when it was twelve o'clock at midnight, that's when Jeff came on. That's when my birthday was. Oh, God. <laughs> so, part, yeah, <laughs> that was class. And um, I wrote down as well. So you do a bit um, for charity as well, don't you, with the festival on the side? Yeah. So when I was growing up clubbing for years in uh, Club Sixty Nine. Uh, I had a pal called David Byrne and he unfortunately committed suicide and it was all due to partying and a kind of unba- unbalanced lifestyle. So I felt that it was it was important to try and reach out to people through music and through the party. So I joined up with Scottish Association for Mental Health, uh, Sam H. And uh, yeah, we just got this close bond and we've got over 6,000, 7,000 pounds raised and yeah, it's just a nice wee touch you can do to the party and keep every keep every day remind every day that there's yeah. always somebody there to help. Because yeah, I think it's like, important. Even though people do tend to talk about talk, people talk about trying to raise awareness and talk about it more. It clearly mm-hmm. isn't spoke about enough. So I think anything that can point people in the right direction, especially with partying, because despite yeah. people talking about it, it's still hugely not spoke about. No. Well, y- People like to show off at the party, don't they? They like to talk, yeah. talk to you as if how much party they do, how much gear they do, how, many, how much whatever. But they don't tell you about the, mon- the Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and that, that, 
I've been there. It's a dark place, man. You know what I mean? So yeah, yeah, yeah. I was like, fuck, fuck that's quite, it's quite important, really, just to. I play, think so. Yeah. Drive that, drive that through the party. So it's it's been important. And how did you find that stream recently? Because I know for a fact myself, we're actually doing the hide and seek stream tomorrow. Um, I <laughs> actually DJing the stream is like it's hot. It's, it's fun when you're doing it, but the whole mental preparation of knowing it's being filmed and it's like now or never and it's going to yeah. be out there forever is kind of a weird it's just a stress that's not felt yeah, like, yeah. I, when, I, when I first started promoting I'd never ever thought this would be a thing like virtual, yeah. that virtual festival so I was I, when we done the live stream I was the first one on the decks and I didn't really I didn't really think about it until I started DJing and then I was like whoa this is fucking weird yeah. <laughs> it was weird because I had like all like Jack Master and the other DJs behind me, and like you can't see them, but you feel them watching you. But there's yeah. no different day, and it just kind of—it was such a surreal situation. I was a wee bit, a wee bit nervous, and a couple of mixes were a wee bit out of place. But uh, yeah, it was—it was a different experience. I think it was important to do it because it, now and it's it's more important than ever to have content really because there's that many, it many festivals you need. You know, you still need to kind of shout your voice and get heard uh, because you get left behind, unfortunately, if you don't. Because the young ones these days just want new content constantly, like just yeah. for attention. The attention spans are very, yeah. very limited, I feel, anyway. I think the shelf life of anything, including tracks, I think you can make, you can spend six months working on an EP and it can be forgotten about within two weeks. No, I think there's that much music coming out, that much yeah. content coming out. And unless you do kind of spam things sometimes, the message doesn't get across because people just scroll, scroll. And people mm. don't even see half the stuff. Yeah. Like the amount of times they message, like, oh, when did that track come out? And it's off. Oh, they didn't even see it the first time around. No, yeah. you're 100% right. It's, uh, it's, it's very difficult to be seen now in the scene. Uh, I, find, I find clubbing is in a big risk. I don't think clubs are going to have much say in the next five years, personally. As you know, I had Club 69. Uh, yeah owned that for uh, nearly two years there and I just decided to kind of uh, sell my shares and go elsewhere but I don't feel I feel young youngsters so the young ones coming through would rather save their money for a big yeah, festival yeah yeah so, so if there's 60 acts playing at a festival that's 70 quid and then they can see all the DJs and they only see the DJs for 20 minutes and then they go to the next 10 they're not really they don't really care about a long two-hour set or three-hour sets anymore. Yeah. So I feel that young ones these days are just going to keep their money, go to the big festivals, and in between they'll just sit in the house with their pals and get get fucked up probably, and then yeah. and save money. But yeah, I, th I think clubbing is very. I don't really see a future for it, and it's quite sad to be honest. I hope I hope I'm wrong. But I know what I, you mean massively. I yeah. think I think it's hard. I think if I was when I was eighteen. Luckily, there was Sankey's in Manchester, which yeah. did did focus on proper DJs with longer sets, which mm -hmm. is like now is unheard of, really, because it stayed until no. 6 p.m. as well. Nowhere is open till 6 a.m. now. Um, so mm -hmm. if I was 18 now and I could spend 30 quid and see 30 massive DJs, it's hard to try and just yeah. because you still got to charge. We have to charge upwards of 15 20, to 20 quid for some big bookings for you and me, and yeah. I don't blame kids in a way, but. Yeah. I wish they would knew, but I think oh, it's hard, isn't it, to how to try and educate someone to understand that's going to be better. Because the brain logically thinks the more you, the more choice, it's going to be better, surely. Yeah, no, that's that, that is exactly the dilemma at the moment. Yeah. And yeah, that like it's very difficult to go against these big festivals that are throwing mega money at artists, like mega money. Like I know I run a festival, but it is only a thousand people. Yeah. Uh, each day and. I've got a set cap of how much I'll pay for a DJ, but if you, you I hear a festival, even my competition up here, uh, often 60 grand to DJs. It's yeah. Like, no, which, it's, they're only human. Yeah, they're only but, human after all, and it's, it's, they're not going to say no, are they, when they've got... <laughs> no, exactly. Like, you're not going to say no to that. And that, that filters down to clubs, really. Why would, you, why would you play a club at 400 capacity when you're getting offered... 60 grand a festival and it's, it's not as if it's just festival season festival season's all year round now because it's Miami Dubai and it's Australia so it, it's 
it's very difficult, very difficult. And my time at Club Sixty Nine, we done well. We got quite a lot of big names. You got some, you got some pretty big bookings, and I wanted to ask you about that because I didn't know the circumstances in which you um stopped doing it. And like you said, you just said you sold your shares, but you managed Mm. to pull in some serious names there. Uh, and you said it was, was it only two or three hundred cap? A uh, hundred, legally one hundred eighty, yeah. Yeah, a few yeah. back door. <laughs> yeah, a few back door, but yeah, we had Scream, Derek May, Salado, like some of them not my preferred bookings, but yeah, you, you, you have to get the numbers in when you're an owner. So, uh, yeah. but yeah, we had to negotiate hard to get them. A lot of them was uh, just through my contacts and friends and. Uh, like uh, De- Alex with Dennis and Pika helped me out with a lot of the bookings just because he was friends with a lot of them and told them how good the club was and yeah and stuff so that but if you just go into an agent with you can only really offer like two grand or two and a half grand yeah. then plus your travel and that so yeah when as I say when you've got that next to a festival offering 60 grand but you, yeah <laughs> you're going to choose you know I mean? yeah because I, I saw every time someone played there there seemed to be insane reviews there was a real yeah. personal touch with everything because I think a lot of the time people play a gig and the next if you ask the DJ on the Monday how was your gig on Friday night I don't think they'll even remember why they were on Friday night a lot of them but all yeah. the DJs that seem to play at Club 69 seem to be the picture afterwards sign the wall and I think them personal touches go a long way yeah it's, 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 a, it's a wee gem of a place a friend that doesn't know it's like 28 years 28 years old like underground, underground resistance played there. Like it was like it was quite a big thing, uh, and it's just it's not nothing fancy. It's just a wee sweaty, ugly dungeon, really. To be honest, but that adds to the whole character. It's it's like it is really once in full throttle. It's it's, it's one of the best clubs in the world. Yeah, it, it comes it comes across like that as well. Yeah, but yeah, like I just felt it was just time to to move on to new 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 things. As I say, I'm. I'm not too sure what the, the outcome of the whole COVID will be for clubs. Do you know what I mean? So, yeah. yeah. That's, I just feel it was at the right time to kind of step aside. I think I'd be, I don't know, I, the clubs, I can't see them being open again in the UK before. I think it would be lucky to be October, wouldn't it? Uh, I, I just don't think there'll be much happening until there's a vaccine. Uh, yeah. That, that's, I, I don't know how you can socially distance in a club. I really don't. And uh, then, and then I've spoke to a few like of my close friends about this. Do you think it will see a decrease in the likes of the superstar DJs getting these huge fees after that? And do you think people will revert more to local talent? I know for one, for you and me, I don't feel like we'll need to splash out ridiculous fees for massive DJs to pull in a crowd. Because I know, like to be fair, like you said before about people going out less, like youngsters in general, I do think when this is over, people may appreciate the clubs for a bit again. Yeah, I think it might be a wee short time spell, but no, I don't. I don't think DJ fees will go down. No way. Oh. I, think, I think when there's demand, yeah. When when things fall, there's always other ones that rise, and when there's demand for festivals all the time, which yeah. there always is, there's always going to be the, the fees. Competition generates these these fees, and there's always competition. Like how many promoters do, do we all know? And then when we come out it after it. There'll be more promoters wanting to capitalise on stuff, so it's uh, yeah, I can get what people are hoping, what are hoping for, but nah, I don't see. Nah. Do you, do you, do you, would you, do you think that yourself? Think well, be- I think I think personally, I think it'll be a good time for nights like you and me, hopefully, which have got like a base of core artists. I think mm. we could potentially do a few parties after it, focus on ourselves. I think there's a, if there's ever going to be a time to push yourselves forward I think it'll be that kind of post surge after this wears off yeah um, while people kind of want to go and give clubs a go again do you, um, do you do you feel the days of resident DJs are gone or do you still think that's a thing because only ones I see doing well are fews with resident DJs so. I would love to say I think we can I think you know what it is I think it comes down to UK I think mm. I think Amsterdam is an example when there seems to be a thriving community still of the Nights like VBX, Piv, Slap Funk, but I think yeah. a huge part of that is ADA. I think imagine like Scotland had their equivalent or Manchester had our equivalent of or Glasgow had something yeah. when people came from all over the world and really experimented mm. with all the nights there. And I think it boosts the profile of the DJs there because it just gives them more, mm-hmm. more demand, isn't there? For one week of the year, there's what 
how many parties do you reckon? <laughs> it must be nearly a thousand. Yeah, yeah. Days. yeah. But I think that was a huge contribution to the fact that residents are really appreciated there. Um, yeah. I think in yeah. the UK, that's always struggle. I just don't think there's mm. enough demand for people to go to clubs to actually appreciate the residents. People just want them superstar names, don't they? Yeah, like that's what Sadie chose on nights out now, so like, yeah. they're, not, they're not going to go and see a resident when there's another big DJ playing in a couple of weeks at, at a warehouse or something. Yeah. Like that. But yeah, no, it's, uh, it's kind of, it's hard to, it's hard to juggle it, isn't it? To be yeah, honest. it'd be nice to think that the, um, there will be a bit of a surge, we'll have to see. Everything's mm. been quite unpredictable so far anyway. And who knows what's coming next? What's that, sorry? It's been quite unpredictable, so yeah. like, the outcome of COVID, because I thought there'd be nothing for it at all. Now we can do outdoor mm. parties. Yeah. Um, in Manchester, there's the one every week now for the next few weeks. Yeah. Social distance, apparently, but um, I'm sceptical to see how that'll get pulled off. Yeah. Is, that be, is, the, in, is, is the legal one being stopped? Is it still going? Do you the know? legal one's not been going on, but legal ones start from next week. Yeah, um, okay. and that'll be it then. I think we've got a submit plan for August, which we'll see. I think it's going to go ahead, but we're just going to do um, residents for that. Yeah. But it's kind of just an experiment for everyone. I think a big thing people are worried about um, people not following the rules and the counts are clamping down it, but there's only so much the counts can do because it's new to everyone, isn't it? This, mm-hmm. and I think yeah. one thing I thought of over the weekend is it's important that people are actually try and do parties at some point because otherwise, mm-hmm. we're never going to get out of this. <laughs> Yeah, and I no. think I think a thing I saw in the news was people aren't actually going to shops and stuff, and without that, um, mm. it affects the economy, doesn't it? So yeah. without actually people trying to move on with life and spending money again and going to parties, and cause at the end of the day, it's a job, isn't it? And people yeah. need to be out there. Let's be honest, like how many Instagram stories have you been watching and if he's just partying? <laughs> I know, I know. Like I know. it's it just seems as if it's just uh, been covered up. With when you're in, I've been in a couple of supermarket uh, shopping malls, like the big ones, and it's all one way and masks and stuff. But I don't know, I, it just seems a bit much at the yeah. moment. I, I don't know, but as I say, it's uh, you as you're saying, things need to get rolling soon, else there's going to be a lot of trouble. Because I know that one of the big promoters up here have started paying off a couple of staff, and that, and, that, and they're a really good promoter, do you know what I mean? And yeah. Busy festival. That's quite worrying if there's paying off staff, I feel. I know. It's no good for anyone. But they're, but they're doing, I don't know if you've noticed and if it's happening down your way, but I, I see the surge for 18 to 30 holidays coming back. Like, a lot of the big festivals up here are doing package from the package holidays to Ibiza and ah, yeah, Berlin yeah. and Amsterdam. And yeah, I've seen a few of them actually. Are they doing them down your way? I've, 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 I've seen a few on Instagram, just general ones, like people doing like Amsterdam weekenders or you know, yeah. kind of Ibiza weekenders, and you just pay the yeah. lot and then you just go and turbo it for a weekend. Do you remember the 18 to 30 holidays? No, no. You never see the, the old club rep? No, things that all my time. That TV that, no. <laughs> uh, but uh, it reminds me of that, but they it, it, it all sold out quite, quite quick. So it must yeah. be. It's quite a demand for it. There's that kind of side of stuff that uh, festivals are doing these days and taking their brand abroad. Yeah, it's quite a good idea though, but I think mm. it's quite a bit, a bit more logistical. Um, a logistics planning isn't involved, but... Well, I don't know if I would be comfortable taking a thousand 18-year-olds abroad. I don't, know how you, <laughs> I don't know how your insurance would work with that. I know. <laughs> One thing I've probably touched actually is... As an artist, Ivan Cuts, are you still making much music and DJing and p- pursuing it, or concentrate more on promoting these days? Yeah, I'm not making much at all now, no. As I say, say as I've, I've sold the studio, I've downsized into my house. Uh, I'm just focusing on more promoting and uh, just uh, DJing, I suppose. I find maybe not quite made for the production. I work well with them with people, but uh, when I'm myself, I can get frustrated and get myself down, and it, it then knocks on to my promoting, and then it knocks on to my, 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 my family life, my wife. Yeah. Because you, your morale's down, and you just because you can't get the sound or whatever. So I took a step back at the moment, but I don't feel the urge to jump in it again at the moment, but who knows? I think know. that's a really good point in the fact that 
it's about your headspace and making tunes. And if it has an effect on like personal mm. life of things, it can be easily done. Yeah. You just fuck you up in the studio, you spend two hours and you, you have a horrific time trying to make a track, then you go home, then you go mm. and your missus. And you know what I mean? It's like, yeah. and you're like within like two, the space of three hours, you've gone from being happy, shit session in the yeah. studio, and then you've had a shit evening then. Yeah, because that's time consuming and you spend a lot of time. And yeah, it, it does. And it affects, it affects my party as well and that because I'm not, I'm not fully focused on the, the wee things. So yeah, I, I don't know. I, I, I'll get back into it eventually, but I feel I'll do it in my time. I, I felt that I was forcing myself to get in the studio and do stuff. And that was making me a bit, putting the pressure on me a wee bit. Yeah. Whereas now, I just do it when I feel like it, if you get uh, what I mean. And yeah. yeah, and look, I've got a few couple of, couple of things I've done over lockdown that are sounding pretty nice. Well, I finish them, it's, it's just up to me. Like, usually you'd be kind of rushing to finish something to get it ready for a party or whatever. But yeah. now, now I'm just kind of like, I'll finish it when I, when, I, when I decide, if you know what I mean. That's I it. think it's a really nice feeling when you... When you do anything in life, you generally do it because you choose to do it, opposed to feeling the pressure of. It's almost mm. like I bet you can relate to this as running. The days when you actually just go for a run and don't schedule the doing a five k every day for a week. The day you just wake up and go, you know what, I'm gonna go for a run. They're always much more enjoyable, I think, than yeah. than forcing yourself to do something. I think it's the same with making tunes. Yeah, you you you've been doing well lately. I've listened to the tunes. Tracks. Yeah, like yeah, they got better, man. I bet it was just that was literally a product of just hammering hammering the tunes out um but wanting to do it at the same time it was a yeah. genuine like i was yeah. having a buzz because i was concentrating on just getting better which people forget a lot of the time is i was just mm. like every time i made a tune i was just like right if i just keep getting a tiny bit better yeah uh, and then yeah. like the ones i've sent you no one will have heard them yet but that was really like i kind of sat back then i was like fuck i've got a lot of fucking good tunes here yeah they were good really good but i never looked at the big picture that's one thing i did with that is I didn't really kind of get too bogged down by each track. I just kind of just mm-hmm. enjoyed it and just made a few tunes. Then before I knew it, I had a real nice um, uh-huh. selection, which takes a lot of pressure off. I think uh, I always tell people, don't worry so much about the bit, like the end EP, just make a nice track and then mm-hmm. just keep going like that. I think yeah. it makes the process much more enjoyable. And you get much support for the tracks? So far. Uh, well, the day, Apollonia, Ben, yeah. Yeah, they're great. Yeah, they just got a, a few plays off uh, quite a few people, and then they're coming on. I can't say which label they're coming on, one of them, but um, yeah. yeah, man, all in all, I'm happy with them. Uh, live set maybe coming up soon? Sorry? A live set coming up soon? You would you, would you ever, um, you ever I'm, wondering, you? Well, I'm doing the hide and seek stream tomorrow, and we're doing like in a real, going the, doing the full work with it, so making it a proper 3D kind of like we're getting a drone to film in it, which will come out on the mm. day of the festival. Mm-hmm. Um, but then live sets nothing um just before lockdown i joined that paramount um agency but it was kind of the worst time ever because it was like the week before covid oh, yeah. so that's, i joined paramount that's a really good agency like that, who's looking after you is uh, josh? josh yeah yeah so i joined yeah. them the week before lockdowns so it couldn't have been worse timing for anything ever <laughs> so it was, just, that's, um, it was also that initial buzz i really felt positive about everything after like a mm. long time of working and then uh no agent for a bit, just working with Kurt, who did a great job of looking yeah. after the bookings and stuff. But then that mm-hmm. would be not the real next step up. And then this struck. So is it still on the cards? But oh yeah, it's all been done. We're it's on on their thing and Josh is looking after you. But it was uh it was just yeah. one of them because uh during COVID as well, I released the EP on Suck and Vit. I even mm-hmm. released the EP on you and me. Um I, it was kind of just like fuck's sake, because the sh- the shelf life of music with no gigs is non existent because people yeah. buy the Listen to the tune when it comes out, and that's it. Mm-hmm. Sure it's the party and that kind of keeps the tunes in circulation for a few months. Yeah, totally. Um, Josh, is, Josh is a really good agent, by the way. Yeah, well, hopefully, um, we can get the ball rolling soon. But I keep kind of messaging him like, "Any parties yet?" And he's like, "Ah, oh, no, mate. There's still uh, no one's booking yet." But I think after the last, I seen a few DJs playing last week or so, thinking like Italy and stuff. Yeah, Croatia. Because actually, I'm and that we're playing in Croatia, yeah. and uh, I seen Luciano playing. In Switzerland, maybe? Yeah, and I saw Jamie Jones playing in Napoli yesterday. There's like 2,000 Italians sending it with not one metre between anyone. <laughs> um, you cannot uh, imagine the Italians queuing up doing social distance, can you? No, no. Yeah, but, especially with, if Amisia's in, they go away when I went to, when I used to hang about Amisia and the uh, Italians were jumping a bit. <laughs> I know, yeah. Um, but yeah, that may, does make me confused a bit how there's now parties in some of these countries um, and it all well, seems to be. 
Malta. They're, they're, they're going yeah. to the festival and uh, I think Exit Festival, that's going ahead as well, isn't it? Yeah, Serbia. Serbia. Is that Serbia, Serbia actually? Serbia, yeah. Mm. I think they're half in the, the capacity, but still, I don't... That's, it doesn't make sense, does it? About the but to know, I'm just going with, going with it now, and just uh, yeah. the more uh, you, the less questions you ask, the better, I think. Yeah, like things is all things is all rescheduled to next year, so all the agents were pretty sound about it, and just uh, excuse me, it's a wee bit more money in marketing, I suppose, but it's, it's, it's not the worst. Yeah, case, Did, I think you were similar to us, and with quite you tr- like soon as it rose, I know we for like hide and seek. We were treading carefully as soon as the alarm bell started ringing with COVID and just made sure that um, no, nothing was wasted that didn't need to be. Yeah. Because yeah. originally we were like, yeah, well, we're, luckily we're September, we're going we're gonna to be fine. Um, yeah. But it, it quickly became evident that doing mm. an event that scale was not going to be viable. Yeah. Nah, as I said earlier, I, I can't really see it without a vaccine. I don't know. I don't yeah. know why. But... Hopefully it'll be here before January anyway. But, so, is you know. are you doing just platform once a year now, didn't you? Because you were doing yeah, it twice once a year, at one what, point. Was that sorry? You were doing it twice a year, weren't you? At one point. Yeah, I done it three times a year at one point, and then it went down to two, and then yeah, it's just one once a year, but it's two days. It was always on one day. Yeah, so yeah, it's kind of more more techno on Saturday with Richie Hot and Fijak live, uh, Anna. Uh, my mate Fraser, Frazier, and then Sunday is like it was based around floor plan. Robert Hood he wanted to bring a more house sound, so he he's going to play house set for floor plan, and then he's Ke- Kevin Saunderson, e dancer, yeah. so Jack, and then Jack Master as well is going to be playing. So and uh, yeah, we just I just kind of try and keep the balance between house and techno. I did. As, as you know, it was mainly kind of minimal platform meeting up until maybe 2017. I had uh, the and Enzo play, but it was I'm not I'm not ashamed to say it, but it was it was, it was kind of a flop really. I, I I lost a lot of money at it, and uh, it was just due to Glasgow not really digging the minimal sound. If I'm honest, the, the like the streams either like your Dennis Silva. Kind of vibe, or they like you're banging techno. So I kind of yeah. had to, I, I had to change change it up a bit. It was a lot of people came down because the venue was cool and all that, but I don't know if they were really digging the tunes. But I changed it up and went down the Jeff Mills and Ben Clock route and Matthew Johnson. But it's still all quality artists, so I, like, a bit harder. Yeah, a bit harder, but there was also. I've always I've got a kind of criteria where it's just they, they've got to be quality DJs. It's not just tickets I like to throw in. So yeah, it was a it's a big change and it, it worked. The Ben Clock party was amazing. I had Minilog play live. I don't yeah. know. Yeah, Minilog was probably one of my highlights for Platform 18 and uh, Sebastian Miller. And then yeah, I've just kind of uh, altered it a wee bit that that way. And then when two days last year we had the Detroit. Love guys, so we had uh, that was fun. The Derek May, Carol Craig, and um, they, they brought over Derek, Car- Derek Carter. Uh, so it was, and then the, the other day was more techno with Emily Lenz, Ben Sims, and Octave One Life. So yeah, I just kind of mix it up. I enjoy piecing together lineups that work musically yeah. throughout the day. That's what I like to do. Well, it's good actually because I remember you telling me, I think I came. Bef- to see you before the Enzo and Tinny party and you were telling me then how you were considering going more techno with the direction of Platform 18 yeah. um, and I think it's good that you, it was such a bold move from yourself to to decide this is the direction I'm going to go um, Yeah, and I bet you're so glad now Well yeah I had to, I had to as I say I, I lost quite a, quite a bit of money at that party, I was nearly down and out I suppose you would say but you, you, you have to learn for you you have to know your city, basically. You need to know your crowd and uh, what you, what what's what's uh, what people are into. And um, it's the minimal scene was big at one point in Glasgow, like about maybe two thousand and nine, whatever. But it's kind of deteriorated away. Like, I, if, I, honestly, if I put booked Ricardo Villalobos for West Street, I don't think it would do well. I don't no. think it would sell. Not not up here. But for some reason, and only like three hours down the road in Leeds, 
it pops off. <laughs> so, I know, it's such a funny... How do, you, how, do you, how do you explain that, do you know what I mean? It's weird. <laughs> I think the co- it is fascinating to think that when you come to Manchester, mm-hmm. the, the, the trends here as well are just more like tech house stuff. But then, yeah, yeah. you go to somewhere like London. Well, t- I suppose a, the taste in London is everything, isn't it? But, um, yeah, yeah mm-hmm. city city, there's a big difference in... Um, in taste, uh, but it's funny because that can shape Unite completely as well. And we always say that there's certain names we just like, we know they won't do well, even though we want to book them. But yeah. um, even if you just change the artist slightly, just to a bit tiny more accessible mm-hmm. sound or whatever, it can be the difference yeah. between losing five grand and making five grand. Yeah, I know it's, it's huge, right? But yeah, it's, def- it's, it's definitely interesting how different sites have, who are not that far away have different yeah. uh, audiences, I suppose. But so. It, have you got any um, dr- more names that you wanted to get on platform in the future? I suppose I've it's, always, hard, it's hard to get better than Richie Horton, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, no, my, one of my best pals always says once you book Richie Horton, you just close the doors after that. But uh, Marco. Yeah, what, what's that? <laughs> Marco. Yeah, <laughs> hey, I've, hey, I've been trying to get Marco Corolla for fucking years, right? And I, I was close to getting him a couple of years ago. But he wanted 50 grand. I'm sure it. you were with me at some ways. I'm sure you said, I'm going to email him. I'm going to give him 50 grand. <laughs> I showed you the email. I'm sure that I, I was like, like I'll do it. I, I can't do it. But I, like, I'm just going for a house. That's my mortgage. That's, that's, that's my fucking deposit yeah. or whatever. So I, I, don't, I, I don't even know if he would sell in Glasgow either. That's, Not that's, right then. I don't know, no. Like, he was huge back in the day in Glasgow. And I've always loved Crow and he's... There's just something about his presence. Yeah. He's the boss man, isn't he? Yeah. I don't think, I don't, I don't think his, his sound is as good as it used to be, but it, it, there's something about when he's on the decks that I, me and my missus and my pals all get excited yeah. for. You he can't hate on him, man, can you? He's, he's, he does what he wants. Anyone that hates him is jealous. Oh, of course, yeah, man. He's, he's brilliant. But yeah, Corolla, uh, Ricardo, I would like to book. But Sven Bath? Yeah, possibly swim bath. I think I could. Oh, does he do his own thing in Glasgow ever? He no. He used to do the uh, Riverside Festival, but he's not done that for a couple of years now, so I don't think so. But I don't think there's many artists. This is this is what I'm worried about, and I don't know how I'm going to go down the road, but I've not many artists coming through the ranks that I would pay the money for to yeah. book and see that. There's not a lot that excites me. I don't know about you. Is it, do you, do you feel uh, like, I like, think in. Like I think Charlotte, I know that and they don't excite me. Do you know what I mean? So there was um a techno dude that I, I met in Berlin. He's he was plays for he's makes it for Jack and that Faddy Faddy um he's called Faddy something. He's on like um he released an EP on Clockworks. Faddy Mohan, have you heard of him? I've probably seen his name. So yeah, he's, he was fucking like good, him. man. I was like fascinated yeah. with the I saw him do like a demo on YouTube. Mm. But uh, I know what you mean. I do think when's the next breed of artist coming from? But this could be the. I think this lockdown maybe is, might be the thing that gives people a, a break, I guess, because some of these bigger artists maybe. Yeah. The ones that haven't kept up with the social media promo and stuff, do they even exist during all this? Do you know what I mean? Yeah. But you've got ones that don't even do social media. Like Zip. Well, Zip's probably yeah. one I'd, I'd want to book. I, I, I did think about booking Zip, but I think that's more, that could be like well, a, teeny, a, a teeny party again. It could end up, nobody knows who Zip is in Glasgow. Yeah. He, he is... He's probably in my top three DJs, I would say. Yeah, I know. I think we've always spoke about Zip, and we always think mm. it's just a risk, isn't it? Yeah, um, but he is, a, he, is, he is a risk. But I, I tell you a story about him, the story about him when he played in Glasgow at the sub club. I tell you I've heard about it, but re- tell me again because I think people have been interested to hear it. It's about the records thing when he goes and picks the records. Yeah, that's it. Uh, yeah. So, so basically, we came to play in the sub club in Glasgow and we were all buzzing to see him and uh, his record bag went missing at the airport. So we went up to Harry and Dominic's, who are the resident DJs in Sub Club. They've been the longest resident DJs and they're good friends of mine. They're great guys, class DJs. And uh, so we went up to, I think it was Harry's flat. And Harry's got a big wall of records, whatever. And Zip just went through the, the, the all the records and picked out about 20, 25 B-sides and then played his full set, nobody knew in the club and it was honestly one of the best sets I've ever heard. <laughs> and Aww. we get we all get told after it that none of none of the none of the tunes he played were his. <laughs> his record bag went missing, didn't it, on a plane or something like that? 
yeah, we're missing in the plane, so he didn't have any records. So yeah. we went up to Harry's house and picked out records for Harry's collection, and oh, just yeah. and just played B sides that Harry didn't even know he had, yeah. <laughs> and then just uh, blew the place apart, man. But yeah. that, that, that's DJing. That's that's a DJ. He's um, really got that presence on the decks of just. It's funny because you get kind of told these things that like you've got to be like this, got to be like that, and he's kind of everything that people say you should. Like, he's the opposite, isn't he? Like you've got, to, you've got to be on the decks like that. You've got to be this kind yeah. of networking, do this, do that, and then he's like the complete opposite, smoking his roll ups, just playing his records, <laughs> yeah, doing what he, he wants. Yeah, he, yeah. What you said there is the opposite, but it should be what DJing is about. In my opinion. Yeah. yeah. I think more people, I know for a fact that maybe a lot of people listen to this won't appreciate nearly how good Zip is. I think when I've mentioned his yeah. name a lot of the time to people of a similar age to me or a bit younger and they mm. kind of almost just like, oh yeah, yeah. They kind of just like shrug it off and I say about Zip. But yeah. I think he's someone that if you've not seen him, go and watch him and actually study it and um, appreciate yeah. what the man's doing. Yeah, exactly. And he's, he's, he's his own booking agent as well. <laughs> yeah, yeah. He picks and chooses. We tried to get him for the festival last year and... Yeah. Um, he was up for it, and then he said, "No, he's got a fly from Croatia." Um, mm. So we offered a, a very nice fee, and then he said, "No." When we were like, "You know what? Fair play." The fact that he, he values his sleep more because he what he had to have come straight from Dimensions, and yeah, yeah. we kind of just took our hats off and said, "You know what?" He said no to that because he doesn't want to fly out <laughs> any sleep. You know what? Fair enough. That means like he generally just wants to play if it's going to yeah. be like, a fun gig, and not he's not willing to go through no sleep and stuff like that. If you nah. can have a shit gig, feel like shit, and then um, yeah, totally. I think that's a big move because I think that's another thing actually. Um, I've seen people highlight this that DJs get pushed to the limit and they push themselves to the limit and play yeah. three, four, five gigs in a week, barely out sleeping, and then mm-hmm. people yeah. wonder why they suffer from mental health. Yeah, I think that happened to Ben Clock. He had a kind of breakdown, I think, and uh, just before he played Platform 18, he was doing millions of gigs. Yeah. And it just took its toll. And I think it does. It sh- surely it does. Do you know I mean? It must do. Because I know for a fact if I'd have a Friday, Saturday night out and play one gig, but if I've done, say, a gig, even if it's not a gig and you only have a few, say, mm. you go out on your Friday night, your pals escalates a bit, then you've got to go for a meal on a Saturday or something, then you have another night out. Then on the on the yeah. Sunday, I couldn't even dream of, um, and I know I'll have to do it one day, do these mm. three, four flights in a row. But um, I can imagine over the period of 10, 15 years, 20 years for some of them. Yeah, I um, think you can definitely can't party all, at every gig. I remember when I, booked, when I started out promoting and I booked DJs, you wanted the DJ to just get fucked up with you and get mad, like get get on it with you. And some of them were just saying, oh no, I'm taking it easy tonight, I'm playing tomorrow. And I couldn't get that in my head. I know, I'm the same. Yeah, I, couldn't, yeah. I couldn't get how like, you're doing this, how can you at party? Yeah. I mean, like, but the problem is, I always say this, that when it's my party, when it's yours, this is our party. It's like, it, to us, this is the only yeah. thing in the world right now. There's nothing else going on in the world. So when they yeah. come to your world for that one night, how can they not party? Yeah, um, yeah well, you take offence, don't you? <laughs> you do, because then you think like, oh, yeah. why, how could you be like that? But then I played yeah. the odd gig and then been like, oh, I'm not partying. And like, what? And then you just kind of like, I wish you mm. could appreciate the fact that as long as you make the effort still, I think there's uh, some people have played and then like not made the effort. Yeah. And they're just like, I'm not partying. And then they've kind of just, taught themselves yeah. you know turned up one minute for the gig and then got off straight away Things yeah different but i think uh, um i do appreciate now when djs say i'm not yeah I, I think as well a lot of djs are not really bothered about going for a meal with a promoter either anymore uh, and i think that's important that's always so the best do I. Part. that's always the best part of promoting that feel um, yeah to get to know them but it's, it's quite it's quite annoying when they don't don't come with you like in yeah, what can you do? Aren't That's one thing. Do. Yeah, we always say that. I think um, we always push for the meal every time. But in a yeah. polite way, but that's when you can really... It's like we say about the emails thing. Unless mm. you get to spend that time generally sat around a table with someone, you don't yeah. forget... I don't think there's any... Once you go for a meal with someone, you're not going you have a glass of wine or whatever. You don't have to have a glass of wine with them. But I mean, then you really stick in the memory and you know that you can speak to them afterwards. Then you kind of well, build that relationship, don't you? Yeah, but I, I always... You know, I always pick the DJs up for the airport, always, because that's a time to chat yeah. to them. And then hopefully you would go for the meal and chat room, but because you can't chat to them in the club. It's too no. noisy. It, it, like, there's no, like, just, it's, it's annoying just as well. It is annoying, that. It is annoying. So, but with platform, it's, um, it's impossible to pick up the DJs because I need to be at the street festival. And so 
It's fair. I don't really actually get to talk to them that much, the DJs, when they come to play the platform. My team at Club 69, it was different. Yeah. But with the festival, it was a lot of them, as you say, were in, played a set, and then would bugger off to get the flight yeah. to play the other ones. Do you know what I mean? Like another festival, they play two festivals in one day. Yeah. Most of the time, and you would do a flight share and all that kind of stuff. So, yeah, I've always felt that it's important to, to get the meal in, but. I'm finding more and more these days that they don't, they, they tend not to want it. <laughs> yeah, it's been a 50 50 with us, but that's been some of the best times, I think, actually, getting to know mm-hmm. someone. Because obviously, if you book them, you've got to you respect them. There's a reason we book these artists, and it's good to spend time with them and chat to them and pick their brains as well in like a non mm-hmm. non annoying way, but just to generally get an insight to what, what the mm-hmm. life's like. And um, yeah. so it is a shame, I think, when people can't. You, I appreciate it though if they played a gig the night before and they've had three hours sleep and then by having that extra few hours in the room and napping it might make them play a better gig uh, yeah but it is a, they are good times yeah I've, I've, I've had a couple of DJs that are not been on form really like I had Radu play for me and he was just pretty lethargic didn't really show any that way, like, I was a young promoter and you put a lot of effort in it and you were just kind of expecting a bit more from him. I don't know if that's just Radu. He's always, he always looks grumpy on the decks, doesn't yeah. he? <laughs> so, uh, but he, he still played good tunes, but just didn't, you never get that connection and you kind of wonder yourself, what was the point of that? <laughs> yeah, I think our best parties have always stemmed from that mm. meal, finish the meal with the shot and then you all go to the club. Then you, by the time they've actually played the set, you're already there. You've already got like, you've come mates them and then I think that yeah. really... That energy from the booth, the mm. crowd can tell usually. And I think yeah. even just like being in the club, then the mates are like, oh, how was the meal? And you say, oh, the meal's wicked. Then yeah. the artist comes. And I reckon there's probably a direct correlation between the DJs that come for the meal that also mm. get to the club and kind of give people in the club a bit more time when they come and shake their hand and that. And yeah. then I think it just sets up for a much better party. And even better if you can get them back to an after party. Yeah. That's, when, that's, when, that's when you get to know them. Because like, yeah. For you, it's, you've always just seen them through their music and their DJ sets, and that is it. Yeah. But then, then you start to kind of talk about more personal kind of stuff and that kind of yeah, that kind of chat and funny chat, whatever. So. And relationships go a long way, I think. Well, that's like how we I met you. You played that gig at um, Stage and Radio in Manchester, and then we chatted there, but then we went back to that right. party. Right. And then uh, I think you ended up in bed, didn't you? <laughs> I get food poisoning. Oh shit, yes, yeah. so you ended up in bed, didn't you? I think that's get a yeah. train on, didn't you? No sleep. Yeah, basically, I didn't have a hotel and it was an Airbnb and the boys just gave me a room. And then uh, <laughs> I just got food poison because I went to a street food thing before it. That's a, that's a tip to any DJ that don't eat street food. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but I could feel it during the gig and then I, I got back to that party flat and it was honestly, it was a horrible experience because everybody was running in the room and you're chatting. Like sleep, yeah, I sleep or just whatever, and I was spewing a lot, and then I was like, I'm just going to basically, I'm just going to uh, pick a train home and just go on. It yeah. was a horrible train journey, and that. So, but I'm glad I done it because I can't stay there any longer. Yeah, yeah. So <laughs> we'll wrap it up shortly, anyway, mate. But one thing I asked them, um, local dub, was as a general question, what do you know now that you wish you knew then? <laughs> Yeah, uh, in terms of promoting, in terms of life, in life, God, then, yeah. Uh, well, I always, I don't know if you've maybe seen from my my social media now, but I've been to Peru and done ayahuasca. I'm gonna ask you about this actually, but I didn't know whether to, I didn't know whether it was if it was a a talkable conversation, but maybe let's talk about it briefly because it's yeah. I, I'm interested to hear about it actually. Yeah, I'll briefly talk about it. Uh, yeah, so basically just went to the middle of the Amazon and Peru and uh, basically get my ego thrown about for uh, 13 days. So it's, it's pretty intense and it, it kind of, it really highlights a lot of things about your life that you could improve and whatever. So if, to answer your question, really, I wish I was much more calmer in situations over the years and getting in grudges with promoters and DJs or whatever. Now, now I don't rush into arguing or anything else it's it, it's more a calculated response so i just take a step back analyze and then go on with it and yeah it, 
probably I wouldn't get as fucked up as at parties as well and speak to people. Yeah, yeah. Chat shit. <laughs> yeah. Sometimes, so, the best, sometimes the best yeah. plans come from them though. Or sometimes yeah. the worst plans as well. Yeah, exactly. But no, I'm, I'm much more calmer now and I would I would recommend MD that wants to find in about about their life to go and do ayahuasca. It's, it's the best experience I've ever had. What led you to do that? Was it um was it a big like did we consider it for a few years, a few months? Um, and what was well, the what was the tipping point in, in do, planning to go or going? I guess I'd always kind of known about it, but the tipping point was when I, I booked Richie Hamid for Club Sixty Nine, and I I just got chatting away to him, and uh, this is why it's important to get chatting to DJs before it and whatever. Uh, but his cousin runs. An ayahuasca camp that I went to, David and uh, Jamie Jones goes there, Jack Master goes there, like a lot of the top DJs go there. So he he just kind of gave me the contact and I just went for there. And my wife came with me, so it was it was it. We made that whole massive trip, and it was a big learning curve for us. I think I'm at that time in my life. I'm 30, 32 at the moment, thirty three in a few weeks, and it was just it just kind of. Gives you a bit more direction, yeah. yeah, and yeah, it's definitely something I would recommend to MD. But it's not, it's not for, it's not for everyday in a sense. But because it is quite a powerful hallucinogenic, but you have to tackle your fears. That's yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Good answer, man. Well, I think um, that was a good conversation. We've covered a lot of uh, stuff, <laughs> which will hopefully um, help people and just. Uh, yeah, I hope so. Man. Better insight, man. Yeah, um, I'm always, I'm always here. I, I, I'm always reply. If anybody's got any questions, just drop me a, a message on Instagram. I'm, I'm always. Yeah, so I'll, I'll link all your stuff um in the um, comments to this. So mm. platform 18 will be back again next year on July the or is it June? Yeah, July third and fourth of July. Yeah. So, so if yeah. anyone. The venue's mm. insane. It's definitely one of a kind. I think in England, I don't think there's anything similar, is there? Really? Well, UK, sorry. Uh, I think Junction Two maybe the only similar one, but I suppose, yeah. But I'll, I'll always say that we done the party first. We, we were the first one to do the bridge party. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but yeah, no, it's it's more intimate than jun- Junction Two. You, you definitely get that feeling that you're, you're part of something, whereas yeah. it's only a thousand people. So yeah. Wicked then, man. Thanks for your time and. Uh... It's been a pleasure. Mate. Yeah, man. We'll right. Well, I'll... Yeah, man. I'll catch you soon, anyway, mate. Yeah, cool. Cheers. See you, mate. Thank you.